I think worship is one of the uh, most underused discipleship tools in the universe. And, and the reason is, the principle is this, that you become like whatever you focus on. You become like whatever you worship. And so as we worship, we're not just beholding him, we're becoming like whatever we behold through him. So worship is a transformational gift that God has given it to us. God is, not, God is not looking for worshipers because he has an ego and needs as many people as possible to focus on him. He is wanting us to worship. He's looking for worshipers because of what it will do in you. I was you. teaching at this school several years ago and I said something in the moment. I said, I believe that every disease and every demonic oppression actually has a frequency. And that if we were to match that frequency, like the breaking of a wine glass, the way that a wine glass is broken, if you weren't in our earlier sessions, is through a law called entrainment. If I make the same sound as this sound uh, at a louder volume, the molecules will dance along till they can't hold their structure anymore, and suddenly that will break. In the same way, there is a sound that you can lift up that has the power to break things in the atmosphere, to break sicknesses off of people, all this kind of thing. And so uh, I'll demonstrate Study that again. Other real cultures and other countries, and even uh, what some false religions believe. And I, I would never try to mix something false with something true. Uh, I would never do that. But I can tell you what, if something is true, it is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way, he is the truth and is the life. And so there are many people that are not believers that have incredible truths that actually Christians need to pay a little more attention to. So I'm just gonna leave that at that for a moment. But as I began to study, I actually found a scale 4,000 years old, 4,000 years old, of different notes and how those different notes affect different parts of the body. And uh, as we do science on it today, we find that many of the things they were doing 4,000 years ago uh, in this area are the actual frequencies of those organs. Back then they couldn't measure them, but today we can. And we find that that is the general frequency range. I believe that every instrument has an authority. Every instrument has a breakthrough. Every tone set has an authority. Every tone set has a breakthrough. As a matter of fact, when I started preaching many years ago that every instrument is of God and every style is of God, I was banished out of churches. I was called a false prophet. All kinds of things happened. And even my own staff came to me and they said, well, not every instrument, Dano, is of God. And I said, well, yes, it is. And he goes, well, we have one instrument in India that they only play one time of year. It's a drum. And he said, th they beat this drum and women dance in a circle till they start levitating off the ground. And he said, they literally levitate off the ground. And when they do, they can tell the fortune of anyone in the village and it will actually come true. And he said, you couldn't use that drum in church. And I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> are you kidding? Get me one of those drums. Today's podcast is going to touch on the new age incorporated into worship. And I hope that this is helpful to you as one of my listeners had reached out and had commented or asked a question regarding worship. And though we can cover different areas of worship regarding the hyper charismatic New Apostolic Reformation movement, which is very much integral in the NAR movement, as C. Peter Wagner pointed out in some of his books and even wrote chapters on it about the power of the transition of worship changing in what it looked like corporately, for a pastoral church versus an apostolic church, we're going to talk about the teaching that Dan McCollum brought to the students and participants at Worship You, which is connected with Bethel Church in Redding, California. So I hope that you find this helpful. We're going to have a special guest on today that's going to give us some very helpful insight as why what Dan McCollum is teaching is very troubling. Hi there, and welcome to the Love Six Scribe podcast where we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. I am Dawn Hill, and I am the Love Sick Scribe. Hey, y'all, thanks for joining me today on this episode. I wanted to talk about worship, which is very near and dear to my heart. And I was a former worship leader, as well as wearing several hats within the hyper charismatic new apostolic reformation movement but worship leader was one that i held for several years and i would lead worship to songs from bethel church from uh, jesus culture elevation upper room hill song i mean we can go into probably numerous ones uh, rick pino multiple different ones jason upton i mean the, the list goes on and on but um, a lady had asked about worship, and so I wanted to cover one particular area because I started thinking about some of the things in worship that were kind of wonky at times that I had heard or maybe teachings that people had latched onto or tried to give suggestions about or believed about worship and what the focus should be. 
And I remember one particular individual mentioning about the worship team needed to play at a certain frequency. They needed to play, I believe, at 432 hertz because that was God's sound or whatever. I can't remember what the exact number was, but I remember that being brought up. And it got me thinking about some of the teachings with that about frequency and vibrations that have been incorporated into this teaching within the hyper charismatic and the new apostolic reformation and i i want to make that distinction because not all charismatics are are new apostolic reformation and and i want to be fair in saying that so there are some people that that um subscribe to being charismatics continuationists but they would say this stuff is way out of bounds it's unbiblical we should not be doing this and i'm going to share an example of that today on this episode with you I have lots of clips to share so you're going to be hearing from more people than just me today which is always good and i'm also going to be highlighting just one particular verse that dan mccollum talks about when he teaches these students and participants at worship you about vibrations and about frequency Because there was a particular verse that I honed in on when he mentioned a portion of it from the book of Psalms. And I wanted to offer some input on it when you actually do a little bit of Bible studying on it and look at the commentaries and just read it in context. And I'm going to be summarizing one of the teachings that Dan McCullum provided in the Worship You program. Now, if you're not familiar with Worship You, it is affiliated with Bethel Church in Redding, California, and it's a paid program, but you can get a free seven day trial if you want to. Now, I'm gonna admit something to you, two things actually. So years ago, when I was part of this movement and the the ministry I was affiliated with, when I was part of the worship team, we had a group account for Worship You, and we would watch their videos and glean from them and in different aspects like that. And like I said, we were we loved Bethel. I mean, those of us that were affiliated with that ministry, we we loved their songs, we loved their teachings. And I've expressed before on here my my concerns now looking at them and really examining them in accordance with scripture. But we use Worship You. Now I no longer have access to Worship You, but I got a free seven day trial just for you guys <laughs> for right now. So I could look at this video because when I was Googling this, the videos that came up. They were coming up under Worship You, and I couldn't access them because it's a paid program. You have to pay at least $9.95 a month in order to access the videos and the teachings and stuff. And then from there, you can do a little bit more if you want to. I think it goes up maybe to $20 a month. But at any rate, I decided to take a few days and with my free trial to watch these videos and to gather some clips from them. Now, I'm going to have to warp them and distort them because Bethel, unfortunately, does not like people um, judging or critiquing their teaching. So I'm going to warp these. And so if that bothers you, I apologize. But just so you know, if there's filters over them or if the speed's a little different, then you'll know why. But we're going to take a look at this one particular teaching that Dan McCollum did, and it was titled The Physics of Supernatural Sound. Now, I'm going to go through the summary that they provided on their site for this, because what was nice about this particular video is that they had the summaries for it. And so I want to touch on a few things here, and we'll play some clips as we go along. But Dan McCollum is telling the students and the participants there at Worship You that the supernatural realm is science and it's not just spirit. Now, he's going to incorporate a lot through this video that is very much new age. And I'm going to support this by the, the guests that I'm going to bring on and some of the things that, that he talks about. And, I, and when I say this, I want to tell you something. I could make this podcast a lot longer, this episode a lot longer, but I don't want to do that. But I want to tell you this. In my research and what Dan McCollum provided to these participants at Worship You during this teaching versus what you would see if you went online and looked at some New Age teachers that talk about cymatics and vibrations and frequency and entrainment, and these different elements of the new age and God's vibration and um, these different aspects. I'm telling you, you could put these videos side by side by some of the examples he shared and it would be identical. There's also a focus essentially on quantum mysticism or quantum physics, which his teachings in this worship you course that you find, you'll find several videos where he talks about the God vibration. He talks about sound healing and open heaven, um, talks about uh, horizontal worship. There's different elements he, he mentions, but that teaching is in this book right here. And if you're not familiar with this book, this is the physics of heaven. 
And the clips that I played at the beginning came from some of the videos on Worship You regarding the God vibration. But this is a different teaching, but yet it still incorporates similar things. So let's go look and see what Dan McCollum says in some of these clips regarding physics of supernatural sound. See if you can catch this for a moment, because if you can catch this, if you can see what I see, you can have what I have, all right? Here's the key. Here's the key. This is a wine glass, we're going to say again, and it's vibrating at 560 times per second, okay? If that sound is in the room, uh, that sound is in the room, it will have a little impact on this, but it won't break it or reshape it, because the sound has to be aimed at the glass to affect the glass. Therefore, this is what I want you to get. A sound wave can be encoded with an intention and it becomes a carrier wave. When a sound wave is encoded with an intention, it becomes a carrier wave that actually accomplishes the purposes of God. <laughs> so when I actually aim a sound wave at something, then that sound wave becomes a carrier wave for God's intention to have a creative or destruct destructive force and the power of life and death is in the tongue. All right, so let me show you a simple example of this. You remember Jesus made that Jericho. sound over him. But what happens when we make sounds that break things off of people? What, do we, what happens when we make sounds? And see, just making the sound in the room will affect it, but not reshape it or break it. Because a, a sound wave becomes a carrier wave when you encode it with an intention. That's why the scripture says, worship the Lord with understanding. That's why in John 4, when he talks about the worship revival, he said, a time is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth, for that's what the Father is seeking. He's looking for those who actually understand what they're doing. He said there to the Samaritans, they said, you worship on this mountain, we worship on this mountain. Who's right? That's what the Samaritan woman said. In other words, you worship this way, we worship this way. Who's right? And he said, it's not my way, it's not your way, it's Yahweh. He said, <laughs> he said Yours, you Samaritans, you worship, but you don't know what you're doing. But salvation is of the Jews, so we actually understand what we're doing. You will always worship at the level of your revelation. You'll always worship at the level of your revelation. Because revelation is what encodes a sound to make it a carrier wave of the kingdom rather than just a testimony of the kingdom. You want something to start happening as you're worshiping or even as you're doing club gigs, because this works in the marketplace just as well, is that you have to start encoding your sound waves with heaven's intention. That's why the scripture says, worship the Lord with understanding. So as you go through, and you just heard a compilation of some of these clips, but the, he talks about the supernatural realm is science, not just spirit. And he shares about an encounter that he had with the Holy Spirit, where um, the Holy Spirit told him that he was going to um, do something with the sound of worship in nations. And because, because they were losing their sound, and that the song of revival has always been the sound of the Lord and the sound of the people. And it is when we make the sound of the people that they are able to receive the words of the Lord on a different level and what God is saying and what God is doing. So he teaches on revival history during this part. And as you go on to listen to some of the things he says, he begins to give terms that are important to understanding the supernatural physics of sound. So he's going to talk about frequency. He's going to talk about resonance. And he's also going to talk about entrainment. Now you may not know what those are, and it's okay that you don't know what those are because there's some science going on here. And at the same time, there's pseudoscience going on here. But um, frequency he talks about, as I said, and he's going to talk about the quantum field theory. We're not going to get into the weeds and all that, but I digress. So we're going to continue on with this teaching so that we can hear from someone who has some insight for us. That's going to help us to understand the dangers of these types of teachings being incorporated into Christianity. Now he's going to go on, as I said, to talk about resonance, and he talks about entrainment, which his definition for entrainment is that it is two isolating bodies of the same frequency to lock and to face so that they vibrate together. And he goes on to talk about uh, Jericho when the walls came tumbling down and his belief system or what he eisegetes from that passage about sound and frequency is that that sound became a carrier wave when it was encoded with an intention. And so this is why that uh, the walls came down because you begin to tap into the sound that is God's own sound. And you're going to hear more of this talk later that is very concerning. He's going to share anecdotal stories as he, as he normally, many of these people do actually, that's not uncommon. Not that there's anything wrong with anecdotal stories, but when you're using those stories in order to support your doctrine and it's not backed by scripture, then that becomes problematic. Now, what's also problematic at the same time, speaking of scripture, is that he is going to incorporate scripture in order to validate his belief and his teaching to these individuals about frequency, vibration, and entrainment. And that's going to be the focus. 
And I want you to consider something. Are we told in scripture that when we um, go into worship, that we are to focus on the frequency in order for God to be able to do something? Are we told that that we are to focus on our vibration and that our vibration needs, needs to match up with God's vibration? And in doing that, that the universe will basically do what we tell it to do because it's as if God is speaking. And yes, he did say that, and I'll play that later. But we're not told that. How are we told in scripture to worship? I'm gonna play a clip for you again later. This whole video is gonna be a little bit different today. There's got lots of clips because there's people I want you to hear from that I think are gonna be very helpful in this matter. I think it's important that we hear from other people that are believers that can help us to understand these things and, to, and understand the concern with this and yet another reason why there's a nail in the coffin of Bethel Church and why you should not listen to Bethel and glean from their teachings. And even though they may have some songs that are solid or past the doctrinal sniff test, if you will, you're still inviting in their theology because our songs and the music that we sing really reflects our theology. It really does. What we believe about God can easily be seen in the music that we're singing. And so if we're singing songs that are talking about how great we are and are focusing on all these other things or incorporating things that are aberrant teachings concerning things regarding theologically sound doctrine then that is going to influence our theology of god and it's going to influence our worship essentially and let me also say this worship is not just in music as i've said before worship is in every part of your life in what you do unto the lord so we'll share that at the end but he incorporates quite a bit of scripture in here at times to try to validate his points and even to insert um, such as Psalm 47, verse 7, which I want to touch on that real quick. Psalm chapter 47, verse 7 says this in the ESV. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. Now, when Dan McCollum talks about this to these participants at Worship You, he tells them that in order to validate his teaching of vibration and sound and releasing these waves that match up with with heaven, which again, we know with Bethel, they, they want to focus on bringing heaven to earth, creating a, a heavenly sound that is going to open up the atmosphere, open up these heavenly portals. I know I'm talking in weird terms, but these are not unusual terms in the NAR when they talk about heavenly portals, bringing heaven to earth and, and saying these different things. But at one point during his teaching, he tries to support this belief of vibration and focusing on vibration and frequency in saying, this is why the Lord says worship with understanding. Well, when you read Psalm 47, and I would encourage you, read Psalm 47 all the way in context in what it's saying. There's some translations, such as when you look at the King James Version, it says, for God is the king of all the earth, sing ye praises with understanding. So he's taking the last part of that verse and trying to use it to justify his teaching on frequency, resonance, vibrations, entrainment, new age teaching. This is new age teaching. And he's using it to validate this, which is really disturbing. But I want to share with you what a couple of commentaries had to say on this so that you can kind of get some perspective on this. Again, commentaries are not the word of God. They're not divinely inspired. But commentaries help you in your Bible study. It helps you to kind of wrap your mind around what's going on, the context of the passage. The pulpit commentary had this to say, when it says sing praises with understanding, it literally means sing a psalm of instruction. And this commentary cites a particular scholar as saying this, every song in praise of God on account of God, on account of his glorious deeds, contains a rich treasure of instruction and improvement. Here the special instruction is that God is king over the whole earth, that he reigns over the heathen, and that the heathen shall also sometime or other own his sovereignty. I'm going to read to you from another source. I have a paper one here. This is the Moody Commentary, the Moody Bible Commentary. I have several commentaries I like to look at from time to time. Now, Psalm 47 uses the word understanding here, which when I look this up in the Moody Commentary, it's referring back to a maskil which is a psalm of instruction. And so when you read Psalm 47, you're seeing how this plays out as far as um, God's character, his sovereignty, as I just mentioned, and the fact that he is over all things. He's over all people, no matter if they reject him or believe in him, he is over all things. He is king over all the earth. And that is the understanding that we are supposed to have. 
It has nothing to do with sounds or frequencies or vibrations or you making the, the exact same sound in order to break something in the atmosphere and or having the same sound as God's sound so that the universe has to do what you say because it's almost as if God is speaking. It has nothing to do with that. And in the Moody commentary under Psalm 47, 7, this is what they had to say. In this concluding section, the psalmist looks forward to that future time when the whole world will recognize God reigns over the nations. The willing submission of all humanity to God's preeminent kingship is underscored by the princes of the people. And they go on to continue talking about this. So I just want to point that out as an example that, again, you need to pay attention. I need to pay attention. When someone mentions a Bible verse, you need to make sure that it's being used in context so that it's truly glorifying Christ. Now, as I said earlier, Dan McCollum has contributed a chapter to the book Physics of Heaven that was published by Destiny Image and was in the Bethel uh, bookstore for a long time. It is currently now unavailable. And I wanted to just share some excerpts with you, and I'll have them on the screen from Chapter 8 from The God Vibration from Dan McCollum. It opens up with saying, Modern scientific discoveries have recently joined the voice of ancient sacred writings to pull back the veil of ignorance that once shrouded the power of sound in God's universe. Today, these applied sciences and theologies can be woven together towards the redemptive understanding of sounds that heal, deliver, destroy, and open up portals in the heavenly realms. This chapter shares a little of Dan McCollum's insights about the amazing power that God has hidden for us in sound. Dan McCollum opens the chapter by saying this, Quantum physics serves as one of the great scientific disciplines bridging the river of confusion between science and biblical kingdom thinking. One of the basic tenets of quantum physics states that the universe is in a constant state of vibratory motion. Simply put, everything has a vibration at the center of it. The chair you are sitting in right now is vibrating. Your body vibrates. The book you are holding resonates with vibrations. Yes, the whole universe, according to quantum physics, is filled with vibrations. And we saw and heard this teaching already that he's going to continue to say this and, and focus on this, and he does it in other videos, focusing on vibrations and sound and incorporating that into worship and in other areas of life. I want to share with you another area in this book where he says this under let's put the pieces of this sound puzzle together. Physicists claim that the universe is in a constant state of vibratory motion. String theory claims that there are tiny vibrating strands of energy at the center of all matter. Genesis and the leading authority on creation research tells us that the Holy Spirit vibrated over nuclear matter to energize it, giving it the ability to be shaped and formed. Colossians tells us that God created all visible and invisible things and that by him all things consist. Are you seeing the picture? All created things vibrate, and the creator initiated this vibration in the Genesis account of creation. Is that really what happened? Ask yourself that. Is that, is that really the focus of what, where's the, we're just focus on the vibrations of what happened in creation. Now there's, a, there's science that's incorporated into it, but there's also a lot of pseudoscience. But Dan McCollum also goes on to, to say this, and this is the last clip I'll share, and then I'm going to share with you a conversation I had. This is called Increasing Our Vibrational Sensitivity. This is near the end of the chapter in Physics of Heaven, and this is what Dan McCollum says. As noted earlier, all of creation is constantly resonating with the praises of God, Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4. God's voice and the sound of angels can also be heard and experienced by man. A whole new realm of encounter awaits those who possess three simple qualities, expectancy, intentionality, and intimacy. Because God, creation, and the angels are constantly interacting, we can expect to hear them at times. But how can we begin hearing more? How can we increase our sensitivity to the sounds of God in whatever form they appear? Open your heart, your eyes, and your ears with an expectancy to encounter the sounds and sights of heaven on a new level. Don't limit your future level of potential for spiritual encounter by your past experience. God wants to broadband your ability to receive from him. He delights in interacting with his children. Faith and expectancy create an environment to it for encounter. Intentionality, as it applies to vibrational sensitivity, is simply the decision to see and to listen. So I share this not to endorse this book, but to let you know what's being said in this book. And there's an admittance in this book that they are re relying and going back to some of the new age practices and teachings, and they even want to redeem them. Now, with that, I want to play for you a recent conversation I had with a good friend of mine and a sister in Christ, Doreen Virtue. She was an ex-new ager. She was very popular in the new age. 
And I asked her input on some of these clips. So I want you to listen to our conversation. Well, as I told you on the podcast, I wanted to have a, a friend of mine and a sister in Christ, Doreen Virtue, on to talk about this particular topic. I had sent her some of these clips because they were very alarming to me and concerning to me. And I was very ignorant when I was in the New Apostolic Reformation and didn't realize how much of the New Age had crept in and was lurking here. And so Doreen, if you're not familiar with her, she had um, a, a vast influence in the New Age movement. And she was one of the main influencers and teachers in the New Age movement. And by God's grace, he pulled her out of there. He brought her to repentance and to saving faith in him. And so I wanted to pick her brain a little bit on some of these things and ask her some questions about a couple of these clips. So Doreen, thank you so much for, for being willing to come on the podcast today. Well, it's always a pleasure to be with you. And hello, everyone. All right. So we're going to dive right in here. So there was a couple of clips I sent to Doreen, and um, it had to do with Dan McCollum's teaching uh, on to the worship students and the participants at Worship You, and that is familiar, that is affiliated with Bethel, in case you're not familiar with that. And McCollum teaches about sound and that everything has a vibration and a sound. And if you make the sound of that particular object or person or et cetera, then you can create that very sound and even break it. And I want to talk about that in just a minute. Everything in the universe has a vibration. Every vibration makes a sound. If you make the sound of that vibration, you can recreate it or break it. Because there was something he said, I know you heard that was very, it was very upsetting and disturbing. Um, but he also contributed a chapter to the Physics of Heaven book, and that chapter is chapter seven, and it's called The God Vibration. So, Doreen, can you tell us how this type of teaching is New Age and why this is a serious concern incorporating it into Christianity? Well, as you know, the Physics of Heaven blatantly says that they are taking back New Age methods, which they claim that the New Age ripped off from Christianity without any kind of biblical... Uh, backing it up. I mean, these are condemned practices in the Bible. You you can see the New Age practices in the Bible, but they're all condemned. So this is not something that any Christian should be involved in. This, I, I'm embarrassed to say that before I was saved, and, and this is when I was touring and giving workshops all around the world at um, New Age Mind, Body, Spirit um, events, I would be on stage, and I can clearly remember this, that I would say, okay, God's at this vibration, and we're at this vibration, so we need to get up to match his vibration. And my belief was we had to go through the angels as the intercessory. Oh, wow. And But it's the same thing. If yeah. you believe that you have to match God's vibrations, which it does, there's nowhere in the Bible it says that at all, not even close. I mean, you, you, you right. couldn't even twist with a, a a, a egg beater to get it to say that it's just <laughs> it's not possible but my yeah my point is that what he's teaching is haunting to me because um this was something 20 years ago i was teaching as a heretic in the new age well i, I played a clip for you uh one that i sent to you there were two clips that i sent to you and I'm, there were more i could have sent to you but i wanted to send you just two to talk about because i felt like that was enough to <laughs> Like, yes. this is just dangerous teaching and it's unbiblical and he he is weaving in new age and he's tying in scripture which I, that was one of the frustrating things is that he was tying in scripture to support this whole teaching and then going beyond that but he he talked about a story and he shared a lot of stories and stuff i didn't share with you and you had mentioned to me about a man named greg Braden, i think mm -hmm. was his name yes mm -hmm. i had looked him up and i'm telling you doreen there are some of the clips that i saw that that he had that I could have put side by side with what Dan McCollum was teaching mm -hmm. these these people because a lot of it was scientific of what he was teaching or quantum physics and and other things incorporating into that along with the new age and he was saying not to be afraid of the new age and uh, not to, to shy away from the, those things because we can redeem those things but he was showing different things like cymatics um, that particles were shaking or sand was shaking mm -hmm. and that yep. it was forming different patterns but he also shared a lot of anecdotal stories. And one of the things he mentioned was this, this student that came up to him years ago and said, do you think that there's a sound for autism? So I was doing the seminar probably 10, 12 years ago in, uh, in this school, Worship You, and a young lady came up to me and she said, do you think there's a frequency to uh, autism? And I said, yeah, there's a frequency to everything. She said, do you think God would give me the frequency of autism? I said, I don't know, let's ask. And I prayed for her and that was it. She came back at the School of the Prophets a month later 
And uh, she said, do you remember me? I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't. But she said, we prayed for the sound. I, oh, yes, I remember that. She said, well, what I didn't tell you is I had a four or five-year-old boy at home who was autistic. And she said, I prayed and I fasted for a month for that sound. And she said, one day, I, I, she had learned how to experience heavenly encounters. So she's, she felt like the Lord said, put the boy on your lap and go into an encounter with the Lord. She puts the boy on her lap and uh, starts going into an encounter. Now the boy starts having a vision. He says, mommy, I see a man on a throne, on a chair, he said. And she goes, that's Jesus. Run up and sit on his lap. And so she, the little boy runs up and sits on his lap. And then the boy gets really, really peaceful. And she said, what's happening now? He said, mommy, he's humming over me. But it's just one note. And he said, green is coming at me, which green is a brainwave, a delta brainwave. He's humming one note over me. The boy fell asleep. When he woke up the next morning, his autism was gone. So then she, and it was a big crowd, so I couldn't really see this. And she goes, would you like to meet my son? And she pulls out this little boy behind her. And I get down on my knees and have a face-to-face -face conversation with a formerly autistic child because of a certain sound. Now, Jesus made that sound. Yeah. Jesus made that sound over him. I'd like to know what your thoughts are on this. Well, th this is where science, real science is conflated with pseudoscience and then is used to support an agenda that New Age or New Age repackaged, i.e. NAR, uh, want to use. So they're just taking um, anecdotes that no one's bothering to say, could I see the medical data to support this? I mean, in autism is a tragedy. Um, I, I'm very concerned about the epidemic of autism and have my own theories about why it's going on. But um, that vision that she related through Dan was very similar to the new age antidotes that I collected. Um, and I always credited them to healings from angels. That was my wheelhouse back then, in particular in Archangel Raphael, who used green energy, just the same as this story, and the green energy would heal people. And I'd collected enough anecdotes like Dan had to make a whole book about that. And I think it was called, and please don't buy it. If you have it, burn this book. And I'm sorry, some people are still selling it when I've said them, please don't. But it was like, it was called the healing miracles of Archangel Raphael, one after the other stories like that. And you might say, well, okay, so that's Raphael. He's a Roman Catholic uh, book angel, not in our canonical book. So, but this is Jesus. So this must be real. And it really happened. Um, I, I want to just defer to our friend, Justin Peters with this, Don. Because as you know, Justin Peters was born uh, with um, cerebral palsy, and he is wheelchair bound, can't walk uh, uh, with anything except for using crutches. And he went to a lot of these kind of healing revivals to try to get healed and ended up seeing that it was a scam that the people like himself in the wheelchair section were never asked by Benny Hinn's audience uh, to go up there to to get a real healing. And then he ended up writing his um his um, master's thesis on the fake charismatic healings. And, and what he says, and, and I've got a clip on this, I can send it to you to put in here if you want. Yeah. But I wonder if you could also give me more information about how these false teachings lead to, it seems to be some genuine healings. Yeah, Doreen, that's a great question. Um, so broadly speaking, there's two different kinds of quote unquote healings. You've got psychosomatic healing and organic healing. Uh, psychosomatic healing, psycho, mind, soma, body, mind over body, uh, psychosomatic healings happen all the time. That's when someone has uh, an illness or a malady that uh, cannot be readily seen. You know, uh, pain in your lower back, uh, bursitis in your right shoulder, ringing in your ears, and, you know, a fibromyalgia, you know, one of these kind of things. Uh, it's not that people don't really feel something, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a malady that you can't readily see. Uh, but these, many of these kinds of conditions, not all of them, but many of them, uh, you can gain temporary relief from just by a temporary rush of adrenaline, a rush of endorphins, a rush of emotion. And when you're in a closed environment with hundreds, maybe thousands of people all believing the same thing, all uh, they're being subjected to this emotionally charged music. They believe that the man or the woman up on stage claims to hear from God, or, or they believe they actually do hear from God. Uh, you can you can convince yourself that you feel better, mm -hmm. and you do feel better for a little while until the euphoria subsides, a new day dawns, and the symptoms almost always reappear. This is the it's the theological equivalent of a sugar pill. 
Okay, so it's a placebo effect. It's the placebo effect, right. And it's very, very well documented in medical literature. I mean, it's a real thing. Absolutely. And people aren't faking it. They actually do feel better. Um, but it's not a real healing. Mm -hmm. Now, an organic healing would be a real healing, a healing that cannot be explained away just by a temporary rush of adrenaline, an amputee growing a new limb. Um, you mentioned uh, rightly that I have several palsy. I was born with CP. I walk on crutches. And uh, no matter how excited I get, no matter how good of a mood I'm in, no matter how happy I may be, if you take my crutches away from me, down goes Frazier. You know, I'm, I'm not going to walk. Mm -hmm. uh, so those kinds of things, you know, if I were to instantly be healed of cerebral palsy, that would be an organic healing. Mm -hmm. If an amputee grew a new limb, that would be an organic healing. Someone born blind, all of a sudden with 20-20 vision instantly, that would be an organic healing. Uh, those kind of healings don't happen at faith healing meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, Benny Hinn doesn't have organic healings. He has an endless parade of psychosomatic healing. Um, now, I will say that, uh, and this is going to get a little bit nuanced, but I, I believe this to be true, not only from Scripture, which is enough, of course, but, uh, but also from observation. Uh, we know from Scripture that demons can, on occasion, inflict sickness. Uh, I was going to ask you about the spiritual warfare aspect. Yes. Um, demons can inflict mm -hmm. sickness. They have some ability to do that. Now they only have all the demons and Satan himself are on a, a short leash. Right. It's you know, holding the other end of that leash. But, uh, but we do see that they can inflict sickness. Now, what better way to divert somebody's attention away from the gospel, away from the cross, away from repentance and get their attention on superficial things that don't really matter than for a demon say to inflict some kind of pain in someone's body. And then the demon withdraw from that person. Hmm. And the appearance is, Oh, I've been healed. When in fact, that's not really what happened. You know, that is demon, so interesting. See, I yeah. knew demons were involved with this false healings, but I couldn't yes. figure out how. I thought maybe the demons could heal to hook people yeah, no. into false systems, but it's really that they probably got the person sick, led them to one of exactly. these false teachers, and then left. To oh, that is so exactly. interesting. Yeah, it, yeah, that's that's what that's what does happen sometimes. Uh, wow. The de demons can't heal people, but okay. they can inflict pain. They can inflict various maladies. And so by the simple withdrawal from a person, the appearance is, oh, well, I've been healed, when in fact that's not at all what happened. But I think there's just enough of that in mm -hmm. this movement, just enough of it to kind of keep people's attention focused on the superficial aspects of life. Absolutely. Health, wealth, you know, all these things. And I think a demon would be entirely happy to give the appearance of healing. If, as long as it diverts people's attention away from mm -hmm. the things that really matter, the fundamentals of the gospel, the cross, repentance, uh, growth in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, sanctification, preaching the gospel, the real gospel. Um, they're all too happy. Satan and his demons are all too happy for people to be religious. Mm -hmm. They're all too happy even for people to call themselves Christian as long as their focus isn't on the actual gospel. If right. it's on health and wealth and all these other things, Satan's perfectly fine with that. I believe it. I mean, I went to Sunday school and church every Sunday as a child and a young adult. We had a Bible, KJV. We read the Bible, and I was unsaved. And I didn't even know what salvation was. So, and we right. had the, the healing. So I completely mm -hmm. understand what you're saying. I appreciate that you explaining that so clearly. Yeah. And, and you're right. You're, you rightly pointed out that other pagan religions claim to have these healings. Hindus claim to have it. New Agers claim to have it. Um, so, yeah. And, and that, that keeps people's focus on the here and now, the temporal things of life that in the grand scheme of things really don't, don't matter. Yeah. Um, it, Josh, Justin said that a lot of times these physical issues are psychosomatic, 
some of them are real of course he's, his is real but some of them he says are spiritual warfare related mm. and he said that demons actually can mimic just like source uh, pharaoh sorcerers can mimic um, sure. illnesses and issues and conditions and then the same demons will lead that person to a false teacher like dan um, or like myself before i was saved and and will seem to give relief because the demons will take their hands off of the oppression and then people say oh they're healed it, it's benny hen who did this it's right. dan who did this uh, it's a miracle. It's the green light. It's the brain entrainment, the, you know, the shaman, the Reiki master, all these things. Um, it's just part of spiritual warfare. And we have to be very cautious uh, with these healings and, and, and really be Bereans. Yeah. I think the one, the, the things, a couple of things that concerned me was, um, you know, first of all, I know both of us believe that God still heals. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. God, God still no does question. miraculous healing. He mm -hmm. he does things that are beyond our comprehension because he's God. And um I don't doubt that God can heal and that he still heals today. Um but it also concerned me of the fact that he was he was creating an example that it almost could be used as a template. And so uh for someone else if they had an autistic child or any anything and of course we know that even the deliverance ministries that's a whole other topic but even the deliverance ministers have now said that autism is a demon and, and all these things and it's just really sad to me because there are parents that are probably going to hear that or would hear that and they would think well what's wrong with me why can't i get into the, an encounter like this why can i hear the sound that jesus would hum over my child and to get him healed and instead of relying on God's sovereignty and trusting God, you know, ask for healing, but also understand that if God doesn't heal, that he's still good and that he, he uses these things for his good and for his glory. Um, and I know that, that things like that with, with autism and children, that can be scary when you hear those words. I know there are parents, good parents, that are taking care of autistic children. And it just concerns me that there is this teaching being created by by teachers such as McCollum and others that it's really putting bondage on on people and then they're not trusting in god through the the trials and the suffering and the difficulties they go through and then they think well then something's wrong with me spiritually because i'm just not able to create these recreate these experiences and get into these sounds and things and then um it's also giving credit to god for things that he did not do because of these false encounters that are created that are essentially leading people away from Christ. That's right. Yeah. It's actually using the Lord's name in vain. Yeah, absolutely. There is a clip that I'm going to play this second clip I sent to Doreen. Um, and I'm going to get her reaction from this teaching because it was rather disturbing, um, though not shocking for what we've heard from Bethel in the past with what the things that they've taught. And if you are familiar with the physics of heaven, and I mentioned about Mike Winger's um, video about this in there that you can check out. He did a, a thorough look at this and was being very fair and objective. So I'm going to play this second clip for you right now so you can listen to it. All right, let me give it to you this way. How about Matthew 18, 19? Again, I tell you, if two or three of you agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father who is in heaven. That's entrainment. Two or three come into entrainment. The word there in the Greek is symphoneo, which is symphony. When you are a symphony, you're not just saying the same thing. Each one is bringing their part to a greater equation but you have the same focus, then it will be accomplished for you. But this is my favorite, absolutely. In John 15, 7, it says, ask whatever you will. It says, if your word abides in me, I mean, if my word abides in you, if you abide in me, there we go, and my word abides in you, ask whatever you will, and it will be done for you. All right, now listen to me very carefully. If you resonate on God's frequency and his words are resonating in you, then ask whatever you will, and it will be done for you. All right, I want you to get this. Scripture says it's impossible for God to lie. Now, it's morally impossible for God to lie because of his holiness, but it's also scientifically impossible for God to lie. This is why. The world was created by the dominant frequency of the voice of Jesus Christ. So the minute he speaks, even if it wasn't true a moment ago, the moment he speaks, all of creation scrambles to take on the shape of what he just said. So it's scientifically impossible for God to lie. Now here's where entrainment comes in. If you abide on my frequency and you are resonating, if your voice is in entrainment with my voice, then the universe will respond to your voice as if it was mine. <laughs> So the first thing was in this clip that, again, he begins to divert to scripture and he uses the passage in Matthew 18, where it says where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of them, which we know in, in context, that's dealing with, uh, with church discipline. 
that's right. what that's dealing with in yeah. in context. Um, but of course, that's one of the many verses and I'm familiar with that verse being misconstrued mm. and just ripped out of context um, in order to elevate it to that you that to in a powerful way for you or to say that God will do whatever you want because there's two or three gathered or whatever. And he also mentioned John 15, 7. And he was using this to support um, the incorporation of the teaching of entrainment when you listen to this video. Can you please tell us what is entrainment? Yeah, well, entrainment actually does have real scientific physical um, support. Uh, for instance, there's been studies with um, taking pendulum clocks, as an example, that were out of sync and they were left in a room. And then when people would come back within a day, the clocks would be in sync. And so there, there is some support for the idea. Entrainment means syncing up. I mean, you probably know the studies about college women in dorms having their menstrual cycles sync up. Yes. And, and stuff. So, so it's taking what is literally, I don't want to say, there's nothing proven, but there's strong correlation. And then twisting it to support this weird agenda that would sell books for New Age and NAR authors um, to say that... Um, that the Bible is talking about entrainment as a magical way to get your what you want. And so it's it all comes down to, is God sovereign over everything? Or are you trying to make yourself sovereign, that you make things happen? And that's really the crux of these false teachings, isn't it, Don? Yeah, it is. And that was one of the biggest things I noticed. Even the clips I didn't play for you, by the way, as examples, he was going on and on in this teaching about the, the body, and how long the DNA was, and if it could reach to a certain place in the universe, if you stretched it out, or certain your nervous system, the nerves are this long, and this is how many times they could do this certain thing. Like, um, as far as what he was saying, it was almost as if he was telling the people and focusing on, and even went to tell them. He said, "Just realize how big you are on the inside." And I thought, what a lost opportunity to exalt God in His intricate creation of what he did of to exalt him and say look how dis detailed god is in his design of everything he doesn't miss any detail let's exalt god in that but instead it was pointing back to self it mm -hmm. was saying yep. look how big you are on the inside if god made your nerves this long and your intestines this long and your blood vessels this long and your dna this long and and that you got also by the way that god has dna and that you can have god's dna and i remember that whole dna um new age talk too and it was all about that we can ascend and yeah. and it's just it's it's people who don't know the bible i mean is the bottom line and perhaps the veils over them as the bible talks about that there's a veil so that the word of god is foolishness to them um but you know, it's twisting Matthew 18, for example, you you said, of course, that it is about church discipline. And that goes back to the Old Testament about having two or three witnesses. And, right. and so it, you wouldn't know that unless you have studied the whole Bible. And then you get to Matthew 18, you go, oh, here's a formula for me. It's all about me. That's what these false teachers want to do is they want to make it all themselves. And and sadly, I mean, I can only speak for myself. Only God knows someone's heart. But for me, it was because... I didn't know God. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know his attributes. So that's that's why I would twist things to make it all about um, me and you, you know, in the new age and my teachings that here you can get goodies and that God was a wish granter instead of our sovereign creator who, I mean, look at the the last few chapters of the book of Job, if you want to be humbled, and we all should, that God in essence said, where were you when I hung the stars in the sky? Where were you when I filled the oceans? We can't do that no matter how much we entrain ourselves to God's vibrations. Yeah. There was, um, I, I just wanted to read this because it, it was, I just had to sit for a minute and, li and just think about what he was saying in, in shock. Again, not, I shouldn't be shocked, it's kind of a mixed bag because I'm not shocked because of the things I've heard, but at the same thing, it's, it's still just shocking that people would say something and then say this is biblical Christianity. But he went on to say to them that if you are resonating on God's frequency and vice versa, then you can ask anything you want of him and it will be done. And that's him referring to John chapter 15. And he says that entrainment comes in when you abide on his frequency and if you are resonating and your voice is in trainment with his voice, then the universe will respond to your voice as if it was God's own voice. And oh, I, 
So. I wanted to hear your thoughts on that too, because I also know that it goes along with what Bethel teaches about this um, bringing heaven to earth and right. uh, what Bill Johnson has taught and their whole premise of believing in worship, which is what the whole main focus of this on is today, because he's teaching on worship and the power of worship leaders to bring a sound, to bring the sound of heaven and to have a vibration that matches the sound of heaven, essentially, and even God's own voice and even it's even bordering on blasphemy to say to say that if the universe will respond to your voice as if it was God's own voice is a very dangerous step to take. Can you please share your thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, again, it's a new age, but remember, a new age borrows a lot from Gnosticism and Gnosticism turns it upside down where God is our servant and, and actually elevates Satan. And this is demonic, what we're talking about here. And I was a part of it. I have repented for this. I, I apologize if anyone's watching, listening, who was influenced by my old work. Um, putting ourselves at the center of the universe is dangerous. And so what what Dan might be saying this with all sincerity, because the devil is a sugar daddy to those who will popularize his agenda, which is Genesis 3 agenda that you can have secret hidden wisdom if right. you just dis disobey God. And did oh, God didn't really mean that. So so of course dan probably is having things happen to him he probably is speaking and he get, wants a mercedes or a mansion and the devil's very happy to supply those i was getting lots of goodies in the new age but you'll never have salvation or the peace of god as long as you're a, a servant of of the devil and that's second corinthians eleven fifteen that people who appear to be righteous are actually servants of the devil i was i didn't know it People thought that I was helping them. They, th they said, I, oh, you know, you're, you're a gift from God. And, and they're probably saying that about Dan, too. And he may not have any idea that Satan's using him. We have to be so careful about this. One of the things that happens is um, when you start to study entrainment and, and the pseudoscience that he's talking about, there's a, a corporation called HeartMath, one word, H-E-A-R-T-M-A-T-H, uh, um, that's a pseudoscience corporation that's got all these wild claims that new agers, and I think some charismatics post too, about how your heart vibration, it extends out this many feet and it it affects everyone around you. And they, they use this thing called an E-wave um, to measure supposedly your heart <laughs> vibrations. Th these are new age terms, by the way, vibes. You know, we as Christians shouldn't say, oh, I get the vibe of this room. That's a real new age lingo. Anyway, so heart math has really popularized this. They've been debunked as a scam mm. over and over again. And uh, but what's happened is that it's it's also spawned this industry of binaural beats. And these are things you put around your neck or in, or headphones that supposedly synchronize your brain waves in a healthy way so you could be healed. And there's all sorts of new age guided meditations that you get with these products to entrain your brain. And they supposedly help you to get answers within to synchronize your brain waves to theta, which is the healing brain wave. But I just want to, for your, your listeners, Don, um, those who sell these products, they warn about possible side effects. And I want to read you one of them mm. and, and you'll know what this means. <clears throat> so possible side effects include anxiety, nausea, headaches, dizziness, convulsions, increased heart rate. Those should be concerning, but listen to this. You and I will get this. One of the side effects of brain entrainment, overwhelming subconscious images. In oh, other wow. words, yeah, you got it. In other words, upsetting visions. And we know what those are. Whenever we, we do these methods where we empty our minds, when we do contemplative prayer, Lectio Divina, brain entrainment, you're emptying your mind, guess who is happy to go in and fill your mind? Yep. Wow. That... So they're, yeah, they're getting overwhelming subconscious images that even the company says, that means people are getting like nightmares while they're having these, um, these products, these uh, methods happen. They're seeing demons is what they're seeing. They're experiencing demons. Yeah. Well, that's disturbing. Right? It's very disturbing. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the whole thing with, with this teaching of um, vibrations and frequency in, in, in dealing with what he's saying as far as worship, but then they're going to take it into all aspects, you know, like he was saying about 
um, healing different things and uh, breaking different things off of people, bringing deliverance and, and other stuff. And, you know, it's hard telling what they are incorporating this into um, if, if they're incorporating it into their sozo um, uh, sessions or what they're doing. But um, it's all very disturbing to me. And then even as someone who was in this movement, as I used to lead worship for years and was very much influenced by Bethel music and Jesus culture and uh, Hillsong and Elevation and other things. And um, even as a false prophet in this movement, and what you were saying too, is that, you know, I pray for these people. I pray for Dan McCollum and those because um, God was gracious and merciful to me to bring me out of this. And you're, you're spot on in saying that. I mean, you can be sincere, but you can be sincerely in error and in yep. sin by what you're doing. Your sincerity is not the gauge of truth. Um, the Bible is to be our final authority on the truth. And when we're, and we've got to use it in the right context. And that's the other thing too, is that he is, he is robbing the context and the majesty and the splendor of God's word and the truth of God's word, the purity of it by what he's teaching these students and incorporating something that is twisting it and bringing in counterfeit and, and perverting it essentially. Yeah, we have. Yeah, absolutely. We, we have to compare everything to scripture. It is our guardrails against false teachings and not only false teachings, but the dangers of false teaching. This is dangerous stuff. This could ruin your lives. It, uh, I, I mean, I, my family has, has been shredded by these false teachings. So we're just warning from a place of love. We hope you know that we're not judging anybody. We're here to warn you because Don and I were part of this. So not only comparing everything to scripture, but make sure that you're using a Bible translation that is that is real, not a fantasy like the message or the passion that um, the passion that Bethel tends to use, which is not a Bible translation. It's an opinion. Same with the message. It's got, I mean, the Lord's prayer has got as above, so below in it, which is a um, Egyptian hermetic occultic um, spell casting phrase. He, he put that in the Lord's prayer. It's just, it's so disturbing. So get yourself a sound uh, Bible translation, uh, new King James version, ESV, CSB, NASB, NIV, NLT. There's a whole bunch of them. I'm sure Dawn can give you a list of what she likes. And um, it's just, it's so important to do our due diligence about spiritual claims. Amen. Well, I appreciate you being on Doreen um, and taking time to talk about this because I think it's very important. Um, and it's not, and like you said, it's not to attack Bethel or an individual. We always want to look at the teaching and we always have to, and we're, and we're instructed in scripture to, to test all things and to take them back to the word of God, because we want to glorify God in the right way. We want to lead people and instruct them um, and point them in the right direction in, in ultimately back to Jesus Christ and his gospel and, and, um, and back to his truth and back to the glory of him and to glorify him. And um, I really appreciate you coming on here and sharing your insight with that. And that God is using uh, even, even what you were involved in, God is using that for his glory to bring people out of this. And so I know we both pray that many would come out of this type of teaching and out of this movement. So thank you for sharing and for um, offering to be on here for, with us today. Thank you, Don. I really appreciate your ministry and exposing, as we are commanded to do in Ephesians 5.11, have no fellowship with darkness, but instead expose it. Amen. So now I would like you to listen to a clip from Mike Winger regarding this book, The Physics of Heaven, and even in particular about this chapter on the God vibration written by Dan McCollum. The way they project this onto the Bible in this book is every time the Bible mentions the word sound, it's taken as evidence of the power of sound to change reality. Like it, the vibrational frequencies go in and brrr, they do magical stuff. Then your, mis your mission then, according to the book, is to discover the mysteries of vibrations like New Agers do, because they got it right with Extract the Precious, in order, in order to do more miracles. And we're not going to call it sound and vibrations like the way the New Age, we'll call it the sound of heaven. Interesting, Bill Johnson preaches on the sound of heaven even today. Let's talk about the God vibration. This is um, on chapter eight. Literally, the chapter is called the God vibration. It says the Holy Spirit vibrated over the waters and then that changed stuff through vibration energy. This is their interpretation of Genesis one. The Spirit brooded over the waters. He vibrated and his vibrations changed reality. 
He did creation through vibration. Vibrations, they say, are the forces that hold particle matter together. Light waves, sound waves, and electromagnetic waves released by the God vibration. What is that? Is that a scientific thing? No, this is just woo, woo, woo. The God vibration enabled the particle matter of the universe to take on specific physical form. Now, you, know, you, you would think this meant that the Holy Spirit vibrated over the waters and then made them into water. Like they were just, it was just like a particle soup and then he turned them into form. But the earth was already there. There was just more creation to take place, but there was dry land and there was water. Well, it wasn't dry, it was wetland and water. And it just hadn't been separated yet. Um, so this doesn't fit the description that they give. Nor does the Bible suggest that by vibrations, God, the brooding, the image of brooding is of a, of a, of a hen, right? There's a, there's a, like a birthing that's taking place. I'm, I'm, I'm guarding in the developmental process. I'm controlling and protecting and guarding. And that's, that's the idea of the Holy Spirit in Genesis one, I think. So sound becomes power in this, um, not God. What I mean by that is in scripture, it's just God who has power just by divine fiat. Like he's just like, let there be light, boom, there's light. But we're going to say that the sound itself is the thing that had the power. We're going to move the power a little bit away from God. We'll still say God's the source of it, but we're going to move it slightly so you can use sound too. As I said, I'll have the link provided below in the description as well as the article that's on Bible Thinker um, on his website that deals with a uh, book review that a quantum physicist did regarding the physics of heaven. So I think that you might find that helpful and a good read if you're interested in looking at that. And one last thing I wanted to share with you today, I wanted to leave you with some thoughts of what is worship. So we talk about what worship is not about. It's not focusing on the vibrations and on frequency or entrainment or resonance or anything like that as far as trying to create an open portal to heaven or bringing heaven to earth or trying to match up a sound in order to break things off of people or to realize how big we are or that we're so great because that's the concern i have is that this teaching is really man exalting it's woman exalting it's self exalting it's pointing back to you and to me and whoever would believe it and the power that we possess it's really not exalting god even though God's name is used in it and, and uh, shifted around in the teaching and stuff, it's not exalting God. This is about exalting you and me and, and whoever else and the power that we allegedly possess. And instead, um, we should be focusing and exalting God. That's worship. And again, worship is not just in song, but it's in word and deed in every area of our lives. So I want to share a couple of clips with you that I think, again, you'll find helpful. One is from For the Gospel and talking about worship. And another one is from R.C. Sproul that I came across, and I wanted to share a little clip from that, and it goes along with the one for For the Gospel. But have a listen to this. I think that you will also find this edifying, uh, challenging, and I think that you'll find it very helpful to understand and just give you a glimpse of what worship is in accordance with Scripture. So what is worship? You know, uh, first of all, it's the fundamental purpose for why we are redeemed. That's one of the things that it says in Scripture over and over again, that we were saved so that it would rebound to the glory of God. One of the ways that now I think through worship is in First Peter 2, it says that we are a, uh, a royal priesthood, a chosen people, a chosen nation. Um, you know, priests in the Old Testament were essentially butchers. Their full-time job was to offer sacrifices. And one of the things that's interesting is that Peter tells every single Christian that they are a part of a royal priesthood. Mm. And the question is, well, if in the Old Testament priest offered sacrifices, in the New Covenant, what do those who are part of the royal priesthood offer to God? Well, it says in the next verse, you are a royal priesthood so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The sacrifices that we offer to God are a life of praise and a life of worship. So it's our entire life and it's not just with our lips, it's not the four songs that we sing on a Sunday morning, it's our entire life submitted to God in obedience to the conformity of Jesus Christ for his glory and for the advancement of the gospel. I mean, this is what it says in Romans 12, we already talked about this verse, but do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind this is your reasonable response of worship. This is this is the logical response to 12.1. 
beseeching us by the mercies of God. So all that Paul covered in the first 11 chapters of Romans, he says that our logical response is a life of worship. And that is submitting our entire life to God's glory, to our obedience to him. And, and I think too, one of the things I love about that first Peter two passage, it says that we were, we were saved on purpose with a purpose. So that it says purpose clause, you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which means you cannot possibly live a life of worship if you are not a kingdom ambassador to those in the dark. So when we talk about worship, we talk about, well, I wanna live a life of obedience. Fundamentally speaking, when Peter gives us a description of how we live a life of worship, it's by living in such a way, not just where our character and our conduct is conformed to Christ, but where we proclaim Christ to those around us. The way we worship is by living on mission so that more and more people are called into God's family and that rebounds to God's glory. Worshipers want God to get the glory and the way God is glorified, Jonathan Edwards used to say, the star that shines the brightest in the glory of God is the star of redemption. So people that want to live a life of worship, they need to live in obedience, walk in obedience, to serve other people, but they need to know that they've been called on purpose so that they may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness and do his marvelous light. Worship is far more than songs, it's far more than music, even though it includes that. It's a life dedicated to the glory of God through our conformity to Jesus and the proclamation of who Jesus is to a world that needs to know him. Our sacrifice of praise, our spiritual sacrifice, is carried to the Father through our great high priest who sanctifies our worship. Do you hear what I'm saying? That if it weren't for Christ, our worship would not be acceptable to God at all. It's Christ who makes our worship acceptable and pleasing to God. So now that you've heard some of these things, and I would encourage you to continue to look into doing a Bible study, and, and I'll probably talk more about worship as we go on in the podcast at, at different points, but I want you to understand something. When those of us are bringing concerns forward about teachings from Bethel, there are many concerns from Bethel Church that really need to be addressed, and they have been by others who are far more qualified in an academic and scholarly way than I am to address some of these things more concisely or even in a more explicit way. But when we're talking about looking at some of these things in general, as a simple Berean, as a follower of Jesus Christ, you are, you are able to do this as well. This is not about judging the person or tearing down an individual. This is about looking at the teaching because ultimately, as I've made a statement before, we want to glorify Christ. We can't glorify Christ when we're not honoring his word, when we're not honoring what the actual meaning of it is in accordance with what his intent was, what the author's intent was that, that God used by the Holy Spirit to carry them along and to write scripture. We want to understand his word to where we're ultimately glorifying him with our lives in these areas. Now, with worship, as I said, and as you've already heard, Worship is not just you singing a song. That's, that's a facet of worship. But worship has to do with your life and, and it being lived and poured out unto the Lord. Even in the day-to-day -day things that you're doing, folding laundry, ladies, doing the dishes, um, cleaning the house, changing your children if they're in diapers, helping them with their homework. I mean, there's so many areas that we have looked upon and we have demoted and not looking at it as when I do things under the Lord, I'm worshiping him. I'm exalting him. I'm showing others that he holds a high place in my life. He has the supreme place in my life to where I am remembering why he died for me, why I live. And it's because of him and who and, ha and how I am to live. And scripture tells us these things. So I would encourage you that when you're in a corporate gathering, sing praises to God, sing them with understanding, understanding who God is, 
not the frequency or the vibrations or resonance or entrainment or anything else like that, because you're not told to do that. You're to sing with understanding about God, about his sovereignty, his power, his authority, his omniscience, his omnipotence, his holiness, his splendor, his majesty, his grace, his mercy, his goodness, his kindness, his patience, long suffering with us. His, I mean, there's so his majesty, there's so much that we can exalt God in and to meditate on these things biblically, meditate on them and to think on them, to be in awe of his love for us, that he loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us on the cross and to pay the penalty for our sins. There, there's a, a very well-known man in the, just as a side note, in, in the um, Reformation movement, you may know his name, Martin Luther. And Martin Luther has a quote that says, we need to hear the gospel every day because we forget the gospel every day. Now, how does that tie in with worship? You have an opportunity every day to remember, and I'm sure many opportunities throughout the day, to remember from what you have been saved. It's not to live in condemnation. If anything, it's to live in adoration before God and to thank him for saving you. Thank him for, I thank him for saving me because I did not deserve salvation. I did not deserve forgiveness. But because of his grace and mercy and his love towards me, I can, I stand um, uncondemned. I stand forgiven. And if your faith is in Christ, you do as well. And we have much to worship God for. And, and we don't need these additional things that are essentially leading us away from God and leading us unto other things and putting God's name on it. and bringing us astray and causing us to wander from the truth and majesty of his word that testifies of him and tells us why we are to worship. Read Psalms. Start in the book of Psalms and read a Psalm every day. Thank God and worship him in these songs that are in this book that are inspired by the Holy Spirit. And they testify of our beloved Savior. We need to have a, a biblical understanding of worship. And when people are bringing in such things as this that are obviously new age, then we need to reject them. And we need to be willing to say, this is error. And we're not accepting this. We're going back to what the word of God says in its sufficiency, testifying of our God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we want to know how to worship him truly in spirit and in truth. So I hope that you found this episode helpful and I look forward to being with you again as we cover another topic. Until that time comes, be blessed today by the truth and the majesty of God's word. Thanks for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. You can also email me at dawn at lovesubscribe.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I hope you'll consider leaving a five-star review and that you'll even share it with others who may benefit from the information provided. If you also like reading, you can subscribe to my blog at lovesubscribe.com, where I release weekly blogs that correlate with the podcast episodes. I've enjoyed our time together today, and I look forward to our next time together as we dive into biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.